Hey gang, welcome back to the shop. I've got another interesting repair here today. A fellow brought this in the other morning. This is actually a luthier built guitar made by a Canadian fellow named David Gilmore, no relation to the Pink Floyd guitarist, who works out of Red Deer, Alberta. The really amazing thing is David and I both are graduates of the same guitar making program. We uh, were both alumni of uh, Timeless Instruments School of Luthery. Um, so this is actually the first time I've worked on someone else's guitar who took the same program. It's the first. Um, the reason it's in is uh, it's got some issues with the neck. Just looking at the body here, it's a baritone guitar and it's relatively narrow for a baritone. It's only about 14 and a quarter inches, which puts it in the scale of maybe a double O, um, triple O Martin size. It's quite deep though. The back and sides are made of what looks to be babinga which is an African rosewood and the binding is I think that might be holly maybe maple no I think it's holly holly wood the top is Sitka spruce and it's got some interesting staining and um, sap wood pockets here that's kind of cool lots of character and there's a really nice abalone double ring rosette here see it's got a bolt on neck and um, the reason the owner brought it to me was it was developing some cracks along the back of the neck here and he actually he wanted to relieve the tension so he managed to get the fingerboard off himself which is pretty amazing um, he steamed it off and used an iron to pull it from the uh, the neck shaft here and just looking at it that is actually a really really slender neck profile especially for a baritone guitar there's quite a lot of tension on these just taking a measurement here a quick measurement that means there is about that much wood between the point where the neck shaft starts and where the bottom of the truss rod slot starts so there's not very much in there. So I told him what I would do is probably um, get a piece of wood, maybe maple or something relatively rigid, uh, and fill that slot and recut it for a different style of truss rod. I think we'll use uh, one of the low profile rods just to pre preserve as much mass in the neck as we can and um, strengthen it up, make it more stable for him. When he took off the fingerboard here, something interesting happened. I don't know if you can see that. It's actually got quite a pronounced uh, up bow, which is the opposite to what you normally see when a, a fingerboard is off the neck. Usually the, the frets, um, the tangs and the frets put quite a lot of compressive force into the neck and can actually bend it backwards in sort of a back bow. Um, I'm going to get this in, in clamps and basically put it on a flat surface and try to clamp some of that out as much as I can, as soon as I can. But I imagine there'll probably be some uh, fret work involved too when we get that glued back together. And the other thing I'm going to do is inlay some side dot markers for him so it'll be easier to play uh, and figure out where he is. So that's where we are and uh, hope you'll follow along with me. So I filled the truss rod slot up to its full depth with a strip of maple here and then took a scraper and some sandpaper and very carefully leveled it so it was flush with the surface of the neck. And I have a jig for this kind of thing. This is just a plywood trough that accepts my little quarter inch um, plunge router. Runs backwards and forwards. Um, I'll be using a, a low profile Stuart McDonald uh, truss rod for this. Other thing about this jig is that there's a notch that's cut out on one side that accommodates the rise of the um, headstock overlay. There's a little lip there where it's higher than the surface of the fingerboard, so it, this jig can't be flat, otherwise it would be canted and it would cut a, a varying tapered slot. So what I'm going to do is I'll use a little bit of super glue, a couple of dots here and there along the taped off section of the fingerboard. 
also the back side of the jig. And I'll peer down through the trench there, get it lined up exactly where I want it, and hold it in place while the super, uh, the super glue kicks off. Then I have a couple of um, cork padded uh, calls that go underneath the neck and secure it to the jig with, uh, they just get screwed on with little wing nuts. Just to add some uh, little added insurance to make sure it doesn't shift while I'm routing. To set the depth of cut, I bottomed out the routers so that the bit is in the same plane as the bottom of the jig. I'm using the truss rod here and I've put two pieces of tape on it uh, to account for the thickness of the tape that's between the neck and the jig, two layers. And I'm using the stop bar system here on the router. And I'll set that in there so that it touches and that will give me exactly the right depth when I plunge. With the neck in the jig, the next thing I do is screw it down onto this carrying cradle that gets clamped to the bench. This has nice flat surfaces on the top and all it really does is make sure that there's uh, no chance for the jig to sag. With the truss rod pocket all set up, there's one other issue I'd like to address before I put the fingerboard back on. Here on the tenon of the heel, um, we have a crack that runs all the way across where the, uh, the barrel bolt that holds it in place onto the body goes. This is a neck um, system that was designed by Bill Compiano sometime in the early 2000s, I think, maybe um, sort of as an addendum to his, uh, the book that he wrote. A lot of people use it. Uh, I've used it myself. Um, I've seen this in the two guitars I've repaired that have this style of neck attachment system though. Um, there's only about a quarter of an inch worth of material from the front of the barrel bolt to the edge of the tenon, which is, uh, that's quite a short span of grain there. What can happen is um, you tighten this down nice and snug and then summertime comes along, the whole guitar swells up a little bit and it's enough to crack that. Um, so if you're building with this kind of system, I think it's probably better to push this barrel bolt farther back towards the heel. In this case, it runs across. Um, I mean, in, in bad instances, it could actually split all the way into the heel. I don't think it's made it that far. Um, in order to glue that up, I'm probably just going to clamp that tight, really closed, and then uh, put some thin super glue in there and just let the capillary action draw it into the joint on both sides. Top one's okay, but I might just put some super glue in along the um, the end grain here, just to try to reinforce it and make sure it, it's uh, it's good and solid. I've just been drilling some positioning holes here now that the truss rod is installed, um, using sixteenth uh, drill bits for that, three of them. Ordinarily, I would do this before the uh, fingerboard is removed from the body, so the two parts are locked together in alignment. Um, didn't get a chance this time, obviously, because it came to me with the fingerboard off. Um, makes it a little more challenging. The fingerboard actually doesn't sit perfectly in any location. Like, the, the two parts don't match up, which tells me that there have been some changes in the wood. I think the neck has shrunk a little bit more than the ebony um, since they've been apart from each other. Um, it overhangs a little bit. The nut, I've got to butt up against the nut here as uh, tight as I can. The nut slot is actually cut, uh, it's not perfectly parallel. There's a little bit of slop on the treble side, but uh, I've got that in as close as I can. So I'm going to wax these things and uh, I'll be ready to put some glue on and clamp it up. I'll use some uh, surgical tubing for that.
Ordinarily when I make a fingerboard or I'm doing a grandiose kind of repair, I will try to put the positioning slots underneath the frets. I'll pull them. But in this case, because we're being economical about it and this is a, an ebony board, I have no problem with um, using some super glue and a little bit of ebony dust. And by the time I get that uh, leveled off and polished up, you will likely not be able to see it at all. I'm not sure if the fingerboard extension had ever been glued down to the top. Uh, it didn't look like it. The finish was undisturbed and there wasn't any glue on the bottom side of the fingerboard. But you remember that it had warped up slightly and I want to make sure it sits down flat. So I've gone ahead and glued it using tight bond, scraped back some of the finish underneath it. In the event that it ever has to come off again, it's not a big deal to heat the area up and put a pallet knife down underneath the joint. That's a standard repair technique for doing neck resets and that kind of thing. So I got some strings on this thing the other day and I was uh, a little bit bemused because the action turned out astronomically high. Uh, it was almost 11 64ths of an inch at the 12th fret, so high enough that you could fit your entire finger between the bottom of the string and the fret. Badly needed a neck reset, so I heated up the fretboard extension again, pulled the neck back off the guitar, and um, did the usual thing with uh, pulling strips of sandpaper to increase the angle on, of the heel against the guitar and pull the neck back into line with the, uh, the body. And after I did that, I managed to uh, end up with uh, 6 64ths of an action, which I think is good for a guitar of this size. Uh, it's an extremely long scale for a baritone. It's a full 30 inches, and it's also got 16 frets clear of the body. So it makes it more like uh, an acoustic six-string bass, kind of. Anyway, a lot of fretboard real estate. And would you imagine that after all that this has been through, having the fretboard off, the warpage, uh, the new truss rod, um, getting put back together. Uh, when I got it strung up, there were only three spots on the entire fretboard where there were any fret buzz. Just a couple little spots here on the low uh, string, and I'm just in the process of uh, leveling those and recrowning them. And uh, I feel kind of lucky about that. So I'll get that done up, and then we can uh, play a few songs and see what it sounds like. So I got it strung up with some D'Addario EXL 157s. That's a 14 to 68 baritone set and it's tuned right now it's in uh, B flat uh, standard tuning I think you could either use an A or a B C would be pushing it a little bit on a guitar like this with an extra long string length um, that would be an awful lot of tension on this particular instrument interesting it's actually got um, a 1 and 5 8 inch nut width which you don't see on very many modern acoustics it's kind of like picking up a Telecaster with bass strings on it it's it's it takes a second to get used to but once you do it's got a great sound really interesting <laughs> 